Retreat is a dark psychological thriller that uh, follows a couple, Martin and Kate, who are coming back to a remote retreat that they visited about eight years ago to try and rekindle something in their relationship. Talking about with these two little fuckers on toast with a bit of lemon and mwah. Martin is an architect. Kate is a journalist. The relationship isn't in a great place. They don't have children for various reasons, and I think uh, that also appealed to me. I thought it was a well-drawn portrait of a of a sort of a modern couple. I think that a lot of people watching the film will identify with Kate and also with Martin. They're a regular couple who are dealing with everyday ups and downs of life, going on this retreat to try and gather up some trust again in their relationship, having been through a miscarriage. Um, she's a regular girl, finding herself in a very irregular situation. And they kind of find themselves cut off from the mainland and the people and Doug, the owner, and the generator goes and things start to deteriorate for them quite rapidly and um, we're not really sure why they're not able to contact the mainland and then uh, this armed British soldier uh, turns up uh, on the shore and um, or on the doorstep, they bring him in because he's wounded and he wakes up and tells them that there's been a uh, pandemic in uh, the outside world and they need to block themselves into this place and seal the place up and block themselves into the house to protect against the uh, approaching disease. It's a highly contagious airborne virus that's attacking respiratory systems. From those infected there are no survivors. It's fatal and it's spreading rapidly. It's only a matter of time before it's here. What can I tell you about Jack? He's in the military, he's in the army. And we get, kind of get the sense that he's had rough times in the army and, and his, his previous life before that led him to make that decision. You know, he's, he's a character with a lot of colour and um, he kind of stumbles upon these two people's lives, this, this, married, this married couple's lives. You know, Carl Tibbetts, our director, you know, he, he's a writer-director, so he kind of came up with this. Water. I wrote a feature film in the first place because I'd been trying to get shorts going for a long time and I just thought I'll write a feature film that's sort of similar to the, the sort of feature films I like which are generally Polanski, early Polanski stuff and things like Straw Dogs and Don't Look Now and things like that, that kind of dark psychological thrillers, Rosemary's Baby, Cul de Sac. How come you don't have it? The script was first sent to me by Carl through, I think, an email thing through shooting people. He got in contact with me. It was quite rare, but I think the synopsis was sufficiently interesting that I thought, okay, let's have a look. So I read the script, and um, you know, it was clearly, you know, a film. It wasn't 100% there, but it was clearly had the potential to be a very strong, intimate psychological thriller that wasn't based around. Uh, money and drugs, but was about relationships and stuff like that. So it was, I was very interested in that. If you want to go, go. But do it before I seal this place up, because once that door is shut, it's not opening again. At the time that I was looking for something, it was like the bird flu thing was happening. So it's about five years ago. And also there was a whole kind of George Bush WMD thing, trying to convince people, you know, a guy who was trying to come over here and convince people to go to war on the basis of, you know, we weren't really sure if there was anything to base it on. It's kind of what interested me was like the fog of truth, you know what I mean? The idea that like one person's word over another kind of really interested me and it was a, and the fog of the media was a brilliant thing, way to do that through and so I guess all those things sort of fed into the basic love of things like cul-de-sac like I said and, and Rosemary's Baby and, and t the tenants and things like that you know and I didn't really want to go the supernatural route it was more kind of there was something I think you could get more of a character piece going and something maybe a bit more dramatic put your hands in here put your hands in here put your fucking hands up Fucking Congo. Hey, Cole. You've been outside. Yeah, I've been outside. Do you know what I saw? I saw a dog's body. I saw a fucking white body. Told you people were here, didn't I? I told you. I told you. With a film like this, the cast became crucial, and we went through 
uh, a number of different casting options before uh, we finally got to where we had Tandy, Killian and Jamie. And it was only, uh, well, when we got Tandy, and we at one point, I think, says, no, we, uh, we had David Tennant involved, and I think that got people interested. Things changed, and we lost David, and then we got Killian, and then we got Jamie. And really, it, it came together because you get the cast, and then once you've got a UK distribution deal in place, other people start to take you more seriously. Well, for me, it always starts with the script. So I read this and I was uh, very intrigued by it and by the potential of it. Primarily, you know, the idea of it just being three characters trapped in this house. Getting the chance to do something that was really a three-hander, you know, in a, in a, in a space where you don't really leave... Uh, that one space. I mean, it feels like a play sometimes, you know, and that aspect of it really drew me to it. Uh, the fact that it was really a performance piece more than anything else. You start off in this little microcosm of two people dealing with their own very unique, very specific problem, and then suddenly their problem explodes to such a degree that they are forced to see themselves almost from sort of a bird's eye point of view and their problems shrink to nothing and they're left having to really consider the fundamental values that they have in relation to each other. The idea is that you've got two men, you've got kind of this very physical army guy, practical man, who deals with everything in a very sort of direct sort of way, orders and, um, you know, uh, you know, not an emotional way, whereas you've got somebody like Martin who's an architect and, we're, and, you know, had a very different life, deals with things in a way that are kind of it's more cerebral, maybe, you know, and that's why they don't ever meet head on, or they do early on in the film. And quickly, Martin is is sort of disarmed by the, the the army man. You know, the man is no match for the the soldier. Jack is rigid and masculine, very dominating kind of person. You know, Martin is a middle class architect who is a feeler and a thinker. What the fuck is a ratchet screwdriver? He's not a very uh, physical guy. You know, when the generator breaks down and things like that, I think he's lacking perhaps in that. In that regard, but I think he's a very good man and loves his wife. I think they both envy different aspects of each other's personalities, um, and I think they also reflect each other really well. It's another good sign of the, uh, you know, of the script. They sort of start becoming each other or stepping into each other's shoes over the course of the film, sort of morphing into each other's characters or or uh, or influencing each other hugely. And and and, and I like I, li I like that element of the story as well, you know. The, the lines become blurred. What are you gonna do, man? Huh? Huh? What's your big fucking plan? You have no idea, do you? You gonna shoot me? Mine. No. Stop it! In writing the script, Carl was more interested in how the narrative how the characters can can sort of weave you through the storyline. And it just so happened that Kate's place in the story allowed her to be the last, last man standing. I didn't really consciously do it. I just thought that sort of character is more interesting if it's a woman and is more capable of acting in that manner, you know what I mean, than a man. I'm going to get us help. I'm going to find a way. OK, and we're going to get out of here. We were searching for locations for a considerable amount of time. We were looking at Newfoundland and Iceland and Ireland, and basically anywhere that, that where you could find a remote cottage that was a character in itself that would do something for the film. We came across one that was for rent in North Wales, and, um, and on the photos it looked quite impressive. It was a stone cottage and it had different aspects to it, it was remote. But uh, we weren't, I wasn't 100% convinced, and neither was Carl. And then Richard sent me photos and said, maybe our own house will work. And he sent me this photo of his own house and an exterior. And the second that I saw this house, I rang up Carl and I said, this is the place where we need to film retreats. It was just immediate. You looked at it and went, it is iconic. It stands by itself. It does, without even needing to see the interior, you just knew that this was the place. So when we walked in, we just went, oh, okay. 
yeah this is it we can do this this is amazing you know you just wouldn't you wouldn't think to to do a layout like this you wouldn't think to you'd never get the thickness of the walls you know you'd never get that real feeling of being you know the howling wind and wind and rain outside you know and that oppression you know that you get from actually working in a real location <laughs> From the off, Carl and I were quite clear that we didn't want to make uh, something that was going straight to DVD. And so we have always said, be bold where we can. You know, with a low budget film, you do get important decisions like the location and getting the script right. For example, there were lots of things where, at the early stages of the script, there was too much dialogue. And, you know, I sort of say to Carl, look, there are lots of psychological thrillers where almost minimal dialogue is, is, is more cinematic, where you use music and atmosphere and looks between people. And I think that was always a sort of shared vision of how the film would be. And I think Carl had taken things like Polanski as his, as his, his sort of guide references, which, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Polanski, so I knew that that was a strong thing. But the other thing is really about getting strong characters and strong performances from those actors. And I think that's really what lifts it. That's a first symptom. He's got it. <laughs> He's got a fucking disease. There is a fucking disease! One of the hugest challenges was getting people to have confidence in a first time director because Carl had really not done anything um, as a director at all. And he'd worked as an editor, but he'd never really directed anything. He'd done a couple of short films, but they were really very, very, you know, the new style of things. Guy goes out with a camera, shoots a short film kind of thing. So he'd never been on a film set and he'd never. Uh, worked with a proper professional crew or worked with professional actors. And so persuading distributors that that this particular first-time director was worth investing in on the basis of his script was uh, an enormous challenge. I'm relieved that it's happening. There are two things that happen, basically. You kind of go, brilliant, it's happening, and then you go, oh shit, it's happening. You know, you go, fabulous, I'm actually going to fucking be doing this. I'm actually going to be directing the film I've always wanted to direct and, and, and you know that's really what I want to do and then kind of go oh I've actually got to you know now I've actually got to do it. I love working with first time directors there's a there's an energy to it that is nothing like working with a, a more seasoned director he's very unconventional and he's very open to new ideas and he's very open to actors you know coming in and kind of um, giving their version of things and him molding his baby and his story to these three people. And I think that is really Carl's uh, brilliance. To see him go from almost like a, a geek of the movie experience to on the set, solid, with weight, and fulfilling the role in a... Like I said, it's, it's a real privilege to have been to have witnessed that happening, to see the arrival of someone who is now a fully-fledged filmmaker and really filling the space. He absolutely has great natural instinct, I think, about storytelling. He's a very clever problem solver, uh, and I think that probably comes from his background as, a, uh, as an editor. We collaborated very closely in the beginnings before we started filming on the script and the character, and we had many meetings and many Skype sessions, and. Uh, just talking through it, talking through the story, making sure it was watertight and uh, and everything made sense. So um, it's been a great collaboration. I've loved work, working with Carl. Give him a fucking hand. The first appeal for the audience is going to be the story itself. A couple who go away to try and mend their problems in their marriage, and a guy turns up and he says, "There's a virus out there and it's killing people, and you're not going anywhere." And neither am I. And that is, I think, a really strong premise for a film. You know that it's three people trapped in a house, but you just don't know where that story is going to take you. And I think people are very much intrigued by this because they, they recognise themselves in the characters and they go, what would I do in this situation? What would I do if a guy ended up in our house? People are going to go along and they're going to be scared because it's genuinely scary. But actually here, I think we've got a film where people genuinely care for the characters. And that, I think, will lift it into a different environment and hopefully will be something that appeals to, I think, the older audience that's looking for something more intelligent as well as looking for thrills. 
you know, it's not like a cabin in the woods film, where often the woods are scarier than the cabin. It's kind of like it's what's going on inside, and the fact that when they look out, there's just nothing. There's nothing to see, and there's no indication of what's going on. It's survival, you know, and what happens to you when you're left in that situation, and how you turn primal. <laughs> Most people want a movie where it speeds up the pulse rate and they don't know what's going to happen next. It's challenging their emotions and their intellects. And this film's got all of that. There is a urge and a hunger for original conceptual ideas. The bones of this is, is very much an original conceptual idea from Carl. So I think you will be constantly on the edge of your seat trying to figure out what is, what is actually happening. And I think that's exactly what you want from a a psychological suspense thriller, and that's what it is. We cannot let them in here. 